Jonathan is a one, probably one of the most multi-talented scientists I've met in a long time. He was one of the early career researchers at the COP28 cryosphere pavilion. So really got thrown in at the deep end in terms of science policy in Dubai, which was a very challenging COP as you heard last month. Um, and he is currently a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich. And this is work I assume you did much earlier in terms of really taking a deep dive into that very extreme weather event that took place over East Antarctica in March 2022. So this set of paired papers, uh, again, coming out in the print version just today, at the same time as the American Meteorological Society, uh, I believe, is meeting in, uh, I think, in New England. Is it Rhode Island that they're meeting this, this very week? It's Baltimore. Um, Baltimore. Oh, well, at least I got the East Coast properly. Um, so without further ado, because this is a very complex event, these are two papers, actually. I provided a link to the first one, but then there's a second that is the next over that looks at impacts on the ice sheet. And I assume we'll hear about both of these things. So uh, please take it away, Jonathan. Really look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Pam, for the introduction. So yeah, let me get this onto this screen here. I believe this is what I want. Yeah, this is, looks, looks good to me. Yeah, it looks good here too. All right. Oh, I get too ahead of myself. Um, perfect. All right, so let's just get right into this. So I, I plan to speak for about maybe 45 minutes, but if I go on too long, feel, feel free to just like yell at me and we'll, uh, I'll skip to the end. Um, so yeah, as Pam mentioned, um, we just had a couple papers published regarding this extreme heat wave event in East Antarctica. Um, the presentation I'm going to give today will include those results, and I will also kind of provide a, a long background context about why events like this heat wave actually matter and are more than just a uh, meteorological curiosity. So. Um, the overall theme of this project, of this presentation today, we'll be discussing how the impacts of, of moisture transport uh, impacts uh, heat extremes across Antarctica. So let's see. All right. So first, let me just set the stage for where we are. I know this is Arctic 21, so we're going to the, the other uh, hemisphere today. But what is important to note about Antarctica is that it is a polar desert. And like any good desert, it is very sensitive to extremes in precipitation and temperature. Um, you have to imagine that it doesn't snow very often in the continent, and any major snowfall event has very long-lasting impacts on the on the health of the ice sheet. So where my story begins actually is where this red circle is in West Antarctica, um, specifically here in uh, Waste Divide. I was working there as a weather observer in January 2016. Um, and it was a very high elevation location, quite cold as well. But when I was working there as a weather observer, uh, we had this very unusual period of really warm temperatures. It actually made it to around zero degrees at the camp with uh, melting as high up as 1,800 meters. And across the, the rest of the West Antarctic ice uh, sheet, we had actual temperatures above freezing, which resulted in widespread melting and was the focus of this study that um, kind of described the event shortly thereafter. Um, now, when I started my PhD some years later, I wanted to revisit this event. And when I was looking at the satellite imagery to kind of figure out what really was the trigger for this really warm weather, uh, I noticed that there was a cloud pattern that very much resembled this thing that we study in the in the lower latitudes and like the mid latitudes, what we refer to as an atmospheric river. Especially if you live in the western part of the USA, you hear about these things very often. They bring lots of rain and flooding concerns. Um, to kind of go over what an atmospheric river is, it's nice to look at satellite imagery like this. Like this satellite here is measuring the content of the water vapor of the atmosphere. And as you would expect, there's a lot of water vapor concentrated around the equator region. 
Um, but then we have these little fingers of moisture extending outward, reaching towards higher latitude locations. And these little fingers are what we would refer to as an atmospheric river. And they're very important for the hydrometeorological climate of the world and providing a very useful source of precipitation to the world's um, higher latitudes. A bit of meteorology here now, like we're, how do they actually work? Um, so atmospheric rivers, they are often part of a storm system of an extra tropical cyclone. They're in a lower part of the atmosphere and the moisture and they're often had fell, uh, sorry, they're often found ahead of a cold front. And the moisture they supply often leads to strengthening of the cyclones that they are associated with. Oftentimes they are associated with a blocking ridge or a blocking high pressure, which helps direct the moisture to higher latitudes, like in this example here in this little weather channel schematic. Um, but the impacts can be quite severe, especially in desert areas. Now going back to this whole desert theme, this one was an atmospheric river from March 2000 to, uh, 2015, where the Atacama Desert became quite uh, flooded due to a very extreme atmospheric river event kind of highlighting the impact that these things can have in environments with very low precipitation. Now, it's no surprise if you heard a term, you can associate the atmospheric river with heat, with uh, flooding, but I'm here today more to discuss how they're linked with heat waves instead. Going back to now June 2021, we had this very extreme heat wave um, in Western North America. We saw new temperature, uh, like we saw the all-time temperature records being smashed in places like uh, uh, British Columbia and Lytton uh, by about four degrees, I believe, was uh, what the temperature was what the record was uh, smashed by. And then shortly after that record was smashed, the town of Lytton uh, burned to the ground in a wildfire. So anyway, um, in this study here, they're basically, um, oh, sorry, this was the graphic I was looking for, right? Yeah, so basically it smashed the previous temperature record by 4.6 degrees in Litton, showing this graphic here shows really well just how much of a deviation this new temperature record was compared to the climate that you normally would observe in Litton. And the right showing the uh, impact of this extreme temperature event. Now, this event could be at, was actually attributed to several things. One was an atmosphere river that was happening to the north of the heat wave, the moisture from this atmospheric river, think of it as like putting a, a roof on a greenhouse over over the uh, the grounds basically, helps capture a lot of the, the solar radiation that enters um, the lower atmosphere and prevents it from escaping. And the moisture from this atmospheric river basically creates the greenhouse effect, allowing the temperatures to increase quite significantly. So that's the thermodynamic of, uh, effect there's also the dynamic effect as well. What we um, and I'm not going to go crazy in the math here. Don't worry, I'm not gonna. This won't be a test in this equation afterwards. But basically, what this is describing here in the study was that if you remove the impacts that the atmospheric river had on the dynamics of the atmosphere, um, you actually don't get the, the the jet stream pattern that resulted in the heat wave. It the, the becomes a a flat jet stream, you don't get the blocking high and you don't get the heat wave. So what this uh, heat wave in Canada could be characterized as is what we refer to as a black swan event um, with this little cute little black swan here to, to kind of demonstrate that. But when I say black swan, I'm referring to an event of extreme consequence that was not well predicted, but perhaps in hindsight should have been. So something that we should have saw coming, but it kind of redefines our view of the climate afterwards. And these are becoming more frequent as the climate continues to warm. It, you might hear very often that there's new temperature records being broken every day somewhere across the planet. And this is happening because in a stable climate, you actually expect temperature records uh, to remain quite stable. The longer a station is recording data, the more um, history it has to basically create a temperature climatology from, and the less chances that you're going to record a new higher temperature than was ever observed before. But if the temperature is not stable, which we're currently observing, 
um, we see that like here the the return time of heat extremes begins to um, well the this is here showing the 200 year return time and 500 year return time of heat extremes begins to increase so now well, a once in 100 year event could have been a uh, a six degree temperature anomaly now becomes a nine degree temperature anomaly, thus shattering the previous record. Okay, so why does why does all of this matter for the polar ice sheet? So, so first we need to describe um, the basic process of ice of mass accumulation and just discharge for ice sheets, particularly over Antarctica. Over Antarctica, you have a polar ice cap. It snows on the polar ice cap that creates mass. Um, that either uh, accumulates or sublimates on the ice sheet. That mass then either will melt via warm temperatures, or it will move towards the coastlines in the form of in, in the form of glaciers, and then arrive at the at the ice shelf, where we'll have the, the just discharge of the glacier. So you have these two components: the surface mass balance, which is the the combination of snowfall and melting, plus the discharge term, which is the ice that is being uh as that that's flowing off the ice sheet and you get your total mass balance now across antarctica we know that the antarctic ice sheet is losing mass um, and that has been accelerating over the years mostly being driven by the loss of of uh ice in west antarctica here in this um, green line here there we go now a lot of us being attributed to the warming of the oceans which is to eating away at the, uh, the, the Pine Island Glacier, and Thwaites Glacier, accelerating the glacier loss into the ocean. But you also have a slight increase of, of mass in East Antarctica as being driven actually by increasing snowfall patterns. In a warming climate, this is actually not very surprising because the warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. It is cold in East Antarctica. So even if it warms a couple of degrees, it still will continue to snow. But now the warm atmosphere will, atmosphere will deposit more snowfall over eastern Antarctica. And this actually acts as a mitigating factor in the sea level rise. Now, all these things put together, though, uh, basically can, will um, create our sort of future idea of what sea level rise will be. But we're still relatively low confidence in exactly the range of sea level rise values in a warming climate. Um, but the consequences are quite dramatic. Um, this is an image from Hurricane Sandy, it was 2012, nearby where I grew up in New Jersey, just showing the impacts of even a slightly higher sea level and the storms become more intense, of creating massive destruction to our coastal communities. And we only expect this to become way more severe as the ice sheets continue to melt and the sea levels continue to rise. Um, so now we'll get into a bit of uh, what I've been working on. So a lot of my research focuses on atmospheric rivers over Antarctica. I created first an algorithm to detect atmospheric rivers um, and then kind of determine the climatology and how frequent these events occur. In this figure here, I show that the atmospheric rivers are actually quite rare around, Antar around Antarctica, the way I define them. So they occur maybe a few days per year on any lo given location around the coastline. However, these events have really large consequences uh, for the Antarctic mass balance. Here um, is a, the that January 2016 event that I was talking about initially. Uh, here I'm showing the the um, what the atmospheric river detection algorithm actually looks like. It detected an atmospheric river. Um, and here we're looking at the vapor transport within that atmospheric river. And here we're showing that, again, like I mentioned, that greenhouse effect in British Columbia, we see the same thing here happening over uh, Western Antarctica. And that was the main driver, along with warm air advection of the very large tem high temperatures that we observed. Now, when I accumulated all the atmospheric rivers that had happened in, across West Antarctica over the past uh, 40 something years, I find that like a majority, if almost all the melting that happened in especially higher elevation regions was happening at the same time as atmospheric rivers here in the summertime uh, across the West Antarctica around the Ross Ice Shelf, 
In the winter, when it should be cold, we still see melting across the Antarctic Peninsula, and a lot of this is also being driven by the atmospheric rivers. Um, another result that I found that was quite dramatic is that in the early 21st century, we had the collapse of the Larsen A and Larsen B ice shelf. Um, actually, Larsen A was 1999, I think, and Larsen B was 2002. And the ice shelf collapsed quite dramatically in a matter of just a month, actually. And looking back on the collapse, um, I found that during this time, there was a very high a period of very high atmospheric river activity. So here is just showing an example of what atmospheric, atmospheric rivers can do to an ice shelf. Now, we're in 2008, the ice shelves have already collapsed. They've been replaced with sea ice, or kind of what we could refer to as land fast ice. We see here in January 25th, an atmospheric river makes landfall on the West Antarctic, oh, sorry, on the Antarctic Peninsula. And six days later, that sea ice has been essentially turned into Swiss cheese. Um, and we see here in this panel here, it also generated a huge amount of melting on the remaining ice shelf, the Larsen Sea ice shelf. So that's just showing how consequential one atmospheric river could be. Now, Overall, what we uh, what we summarize their impacts to be is that you have an atmospheric river has a lot of moisture in it. it right, that moisture um, is lifted over the mountains of the Antarctic Peninsula, and then descends adiabatically, warming as it descends. Um, meanwhile, you have moisture, high level moisture aloft in the upper atmosphere, so you're getting that greenhouse effect. All of this creates extreme temperatures, causing surface melting, leading to melt pond formation, and then eventually hydrofracturing on the ice shelf. Meanwhile, the atmospheric river also disintegrates the sea ice um, on the coast of the, of the ice shelf, allowing the ocean swells now to directly apply a stress to the front of the ice shelf. All of these things are great ways to trigger a funnel collapse of an ice shelf. So this is checking my time here. Right. So that summarizes the melting slash destructive elements of atmospheric rivers but the, another very important side of them is the snowfall that they cause over antarctica now using my climatology of atmospheric rivers i find that this again these are very rare events but they're responsible for a majority of the heaviest snowfall events especially around east antarctica around 60 percent of heavy snowfall or 70% in some cases, could be directly attributed to atmospheric rivers and showing here in this, this figure on the right. And this snowfall caused by atmospheric rivers is actually um, controlling a lot of the trends and variability that we see in Antarctic snowfall. Here we're sh I'm showing here uh, the trends in atmospheric rivers across Antarctica. They're increasing. And joining moorland here, decreasing in Wilkes Land, for instance. Um, I also show that snowfall has been increasing and decreasing in the same areas, respectively. And actually, the total trend in, of the snowfall, uh, a majority of it can be directly attributed to the trend in the atmospheric river. So, how the atmosphere, how the atmospheric rivers change, um, is also how the snowfall trends will change across Antarctica. Now let's get to the topic of the papers, actually, the black swan event in Antarctica. So these were the papers that Pam was referring to in the introduction, um, the extraordinary March 2022 East Antarctic heat wave. First, I should clarify that this was a massive project and was not me alone coming up with the results um, in these two papers. We were a team of 54 co-authors representing 14 different countries. I just had the pleasure of organizing all these people. Um, but anyway, the reason why so many people were on this paper, because it was such a, well, for a scientist, an exciting event. Um, others would probably refer to it as scary. Um, but it did make the news quite um, predominantly, especially in, in, in global media um, outlets, and there's just one from the Washington Post. So again, like this is just driving the team that we assembled to study this event. Uh, we focused on a lot of different aspects. I'm not going to get into all of them today because we'd be here forever. 
Um, but we studied things like what was driving the, the atmospheric river, um, what was actually happening with the atmospheric river when it reached the, uh, the coastline, how did it impact the surface mass balance, what was going on with the surface energy budget, how did it impact the collapse of the Conger ice shelf, and so on and, and so on. So let's first start with what actually happened. So we had massive temperature anomalies across a huge portion of East Antarctica. This area gridded here in this figure on the right represents all the areas that exceeded their March monthly temperature record. For context, this gridded area is the size of the country of India, which is absolutely insane when you think about that. Um, and here we're showing the temperature observations from Dome C Antarctica, which is very high on the Antarctic ice sheet. It never goes above freezing. And the black line here shows that in the summer, we have um, lower temperature variability, but that variability increases as we get into the winter months. Normally, in March, we are approaching winter. But when this event happened, our temperatures went right back up to what we did see in the summer heat wave event. Actually, later, we found the temperature to be around 9.4 degrees Celsius, which was the highest temperature ever recorded at the station going back to the 1980s, which was insane because this was winter, not summer, we're talking about. Now, the people working at the station uh, were, were fine with this. They, they took it in stride, making a little beach day out of it. But now I want to get into the science of the event and describe first what was going on in the atmosphere that led to this massive heat wave. To summarize, we had a lot of tropical cyclones happening across the Indian Ocean um, that were combining their moisture and sort of creating a pocket of deep convection and a large moisture reservoir in the, in the central Indian, Indian Ocean. This created what we refer to as a perturbation in, the, in the, a, a wave in the atmosphere, a Rosby wave that perturbated poleward, creating this sort of cycling, low pressure, high pressure systems, eventually reaching Australia, um, where a massive atmospheric block formed that directed all the moisture that was from these tropical cyclones into a singular atmospheric river that then made landfall on East Antarctica. This graphic here actually um, shows the transport of the moisture going from the beginning of the event to the landfall. First, we see here this stripe of very high moisture transport values traveling, traversing across the Indian or ocean or Southern Ocean. Meanwhile, we have this air, broad area of low pressure happening off the coast of East Antarctica. By March 15th, that low pressure begins to deepen and we have the first wave of the atmospheric river begin to make landfall of rather moderate intensity. But by the 16th and 17th, this whole low pressure begins to start tilting and this area of yellows and oranges then begins to quickly accelerate into the continent, which represent incredibly high values of moisture transport. In fact, um, using my detection algorithm, when I looked at all the atmospheric rivers that happened across East Antarctica uh, for about 40 years, and it's about 2,000 of these events, if I were to plot their average duration versus their cumulative intensity, they normally have a linear relationship except our event, which is completely off the scale. And actually the intensity would make it a destructive event if it even happened in a place like California. This graph here kind of summarizes the meteorology that we were seeing during this event. We had this very large blocking high pressure that penetrated deep into the continent, allowing this warm subtropical air to get um, deep into the Antarctic ice sheet. So what does this mean for the Antarctic climate system? We, we calculated the return time of this event based on weather stations across East Antarctica. And I'll just draw your attention to this bottom right-hand value here. When we look at the, the stations across East Antarctica, the mean temperature anomaly had a return uh, represents a return time of about 148 years, which is interesting because that's actually not crazy high. That's, uh, that is meaning that an event like this could happen once every 150 years, which is either is a sign of our limited time of actually measuring temperatures across Antarctica, 
or just the extreme variability of temperatures that happen across Antarctica. We also use climate models to try categorizing uh, the scope of this heat wave and also trying to figure out how these will, uh, how future temperature anomalies will change. What we find here, and the red lines represent the most intense temperature anomalies, is that when we look at future simulations, and this, these are the dark lines here with the little um, balls here, um, we don't see a huge increase in the uh, frequency of these events. But we do see that the return time actually decreases a bit. So we do expect these events to become more frequent, but this is really pushing climate models to the limit, to the limit actually. They're not really capable of, of reproducing temperature extremes that are this high. What they are able to show, though, is that temperature anomalies of lower magnitude definitely become more frequent um, across East Antarctica in a warming climate. Now, what did this actually do to the ice over the East Antarctic ice sheet? Well, the large temperature anomalies um, did result in some melting along the coastal areas. Well, um, now, because this happened during the winter in transition, the melting was actually quite limited, uh, mostly confined to this area in red that you see here. But this still was very unprecedented melt um, for this time of the year. This red line showing here the, the melt area in 2022, and the yellow showing all the other previous maximums of melt that happened before. So, yeah, incredibly rare event. But was probably the, the most important impact of this event was the massive amount of snowfall that occurred. Um, the snowfall that happened represented 200 to 400 percent of normal March snowfall for portions of East Antarctica. In fact, there was so much snowfall that this and a couple other events actually made um, 2022 a very rare positive year for the mass balance of Antarctica which meant that for once, Antarctica actually slightly mitigated sea level rise, not something that we expect to happen very often in the future. We also saw a small ice shelf in East Antarctica collapse. This was the Conger ice shelf. Um, and it was relative, and what we found in our analysis is that the ice shelf was already very unstable before the heat wave happened, but the associated winds and uh, higher swells from the ocean trigger the final collapse of this ice shelf. So that's kind of um, a small overview of what we discussed in the paper. If you are curious about the other things that we studied, like the paleo climate impacts, like, oh, sorry, our ability to measure uh, past climate reconstructions and the also impact on our ability to measure uh, cosmic radiation, among other things. I encourage you to read these very long papers if you have the time. So with that said, what are the things that I hope to be doing in the future? Because I'm currently in the, in the middle of writing research proposals. So this has been on my mind quite a bit. Um, certain things are very important for us to understand how extreme weather events and how heat waves will change in the future. We need to be able to model these events in uh, future climate simulations. Current climate models have relatively uh, coarse resolution. This video that I'm playing here, though, is actually a video from the next generation of climate models. This is a, a model called the ICON. It's a high-resolution Earth system model. And what actually, I mean, this looks like you're looking at a satellite image, a real satellite image of the Earth. But in fact, this is what the model is resolving, actually for clouds across the planet, which looks very impressive. It's resolving hurricanes and even what appears to be atmospheric rivers reaching Antarctica. But we need to, these are, models are still under development and we need to test whether these models are properly representing these very fine scale features that I referred to in the beginning of my presentation, like um, the diabatic, the, the dynamical effect and thermodynamic impacts that cause uh, heat extremes. That's work that I'm currently doing here at ETH. Other things we need to understand is that that heat wave, the March 2022 heat wave, was a product of unusual configuration of tropical cyclones and convection in the uh, Indian Ocean. 
but we actually still know very little about which configurations cause these heat extremes in Antarctica. And more importantly, how will those configurations change in the future? Heat extremes in Antarctica are not caused by local changes in the Antarctic climate. They are caused by changes in the subtropical and mid-latitude climate that then are uh, that then reverberate towards the Antarctic continent, uh, resulting in heat extremes. So we need to figure out which patterns result in these heat extremes and how they will change in the future. And then the next point, and probably what was the the scariest detail from the study we did of the East Antarctic heat wave was that. So for this event, it happened in March. It happened in a relatively cold part of Antarctica. So we got a lot of snowfall out of it. But what would happen if such a similar event were to occur over, let's say, in summer in West Antarctica, and it happened over a sensitive ice shelf like the Larsen Sea ice shelf, or even worse, Thwaites Glacier or Pine Island Glacier? Would that represent a climate tipping point? Would it trigger the sudden collapse of an ice shelf? That we previously thought was stable and whether that then accelerate the, the mass loss of antarctica even more leading to more sea level rise so we need to create sort of a hypothet hypothetical worst case scenario study for extreme weather over east antarctica and see if it could actually trigger such a catastrophic event anyway i'm uh well tired of talking and i think you guys are tired of listening to me, so I will conclude my presentation there and uh, take questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate this.